let us return to Egypt. It's the title of our message taken from Numbers chapter 4 and verses 1 to 35. Um, faithlessness uncovered, verse 1 to 4. Final plea for faith, verse 5 to 19. And faithful and faithless contrasted, verse 20 to 35. There is what is called fair weather believers. Following God for this is not a wholehearted, unconditional surrender, but shies away in the time of storm. Instead of clinging to God for their shelter and refuge, when the going gets tough, they are ready to give up their faith. Jesus gave the parable of the sower and the result of the harvest based on the type of soil the seed is sown. It was a picture of the human heart when the word of God is being given. The seed that fell on good soil bought, brought forth abundant fruit. The seed that fell on thorny ground were choked and yielded no fruit. Mark chapter 4 verse 5 to 7 tells us, And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scourged, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. There are those seeds that fell by the wayside that did not and could not germinate at all. Mark 4 verse 4 says, And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. This parable teaches us the effects that come from the ministry of the word. Why is it that so much has been preached, and yet so little seems to come out of it? Has God's word lost its power, Warren Wearsby ask this question. Why did Jesus compare God's word to seed? To begin with, uh, seed has life in it. Right? You look at a tree and a fruit, and when the tr fruit falls, uh, you open up the fruit, and you see that there is the seed inside. And you, if you were to put the seed in the soil, what happens uh, after you water the seed, water the soil, uh, suddenly you see that uh, life springs forth, right, from the seed. And there uh, would grow a plant that is exactly uh, like uh, that of the, the, the fruit, the seed, that, the fruit that comes from that seed. How amazing it is. Uh, here, uh, the example is given uh, of the seed, uh, that the seed contains life. The seed contains life, just as the Word of God has life. That is why, you know, the people of God need to take time to study the Word of God. Then there is uh, uh, spiritual vitality and life in our, in our heartbeat. Uh, that we will have faith and we will not be encumbered, encumbered with unbelief. Uh, Peter says, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The seed of God's word, of, that is incorruptible. Right? the seed that is planted in our hearts through, through the word of God uh, uh, would find when it, is, when it falls on the good ground of the heart, uh, the heart that is prepared to seek God. The books of men are dead, whereas we observed. No matter how helpful and interesting they may be, they cannot impart life as the word of God can. 
If you want to grow a living plant, you begin with a living seed. Like a seed, God's word may seem small and insignificant, but it is powerful. Like a seed, God's word produces fruit, and that fruit is eventually seen in that life. God's word can produce different kinds of spiritual fruit in our lives. The word, like seed, must be planted to do any good. It must be cultivated, nurtured, and protected. Jesus explained in this parable that it is not enough for the believer to listen to the word of God. He must hear it, receive it into his heart, and let it take root and grow. Seven times in this parable, and 19 times in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus used the word hear. Hear. Right. Um, the word of God says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. He's not only talking about listening with the inner ear and receiving God's word deep into the heart. Anyone who shares God's word today is a sower. Seed may be a polished sermon, a witness to a friend, a Bible verse that is quoted. The sower does his work with compassion for the lost. They that sow with tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth beareth precious seeds shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. God, who brought Israel out of Egypt, has the plan to raise in Israel a nation for his glory. Now, this is our third series. Uh, beginnings of the Hebrew nation. We have Exodus, we have Leviticus, now we are at Numbers, the third book. And the Lord wants us to know uh, so that we may understand His goodwill toward us. God who brought Israel out of Egypt has a plan to raise in Israel a nation for His glory. Alas, there was resistance to the goodwill of God for them. This chapter gives an account of that fatal quarrel between God and Israel, upon which Matthew Henry says, For their murmuring and unbelief, he swore in his wrath that they should not enter into his rest. They did not enter the promised land. The mutiny and rebellion of Israel against God upon the report of the evil spies, verse 1 to 4, was, will be, uh, is well uh, seen here for our learning. The fruitless endeavours of Moses and Aaron, Caleb and Joshua to steal the tumult. You see, when unbelief spreads, uh, it has a terrible effect uh, upon uh, the the people of God. And here you see uh, how frightening it is when these evil spies came, came back uh, and they uh, spread uh, fear amongst the people. Their out utter ruin justly threatened by an offended God, verse 11 and 12. The humble intercession of Moses for them, verse 13 to 19, and a mitigation of the sentence in answer to the prayer of Moses. They shall not all be cut off, but the degrees goes forth, rectified with an oath, published to the people again and again repeated, that this whole, that this whole congregation should perish in the wilderness, and none of them enter Canaan but Caleb and Joshua only, Matthew Henry. Verse 20 to 25. Our first thought, faithlessness uncovered. Verse 1 to 4. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. Matthew Henry observed well. Here we see what mischief the evil spies made by their unfair representation. We may suppose that these twelve that were impenetrable to inquire concerning Canaan had 
talked it over among themselves before they brought in their report in public. And Caleb and Joshua, it is likely, had done their utmost to bring the rest over to their mind. And if they would but have agreed that Caleb, according to his post, should have spoken for them all as their four men, all had been well, but the evil spies, it should seem, willfully designed to raise this mutiny purely in opposition to Moses and Aaron, though they could not purpose any advantage to themselves by it, unless they hoped to be captains and commanders of the retreat into Egypt. They were now meditating, but what came of it? Here in these verses, we find those whom they studied to humour, put into vexation, and before the end of the chapter, brought to ruin. Matthew Henry said well that there was a discussion amongst the people, amongst the twelve spies, but was there a consensus in their findings? Uh, were they surveying the land in the light of God's will and favour? Why were the spies doubtful that God will bring them to possess the land? Why is it that the people fretted? God has something good for them. God wants to give them the land, the land that is filled with milk and honey, and He has prepared the way for them, right? oh, parted the Red Sea, sent the manna, even sent the quails, and now he gives the command for them to possess the land, to enter the land. So they said, no, let us go and survey the land first. All right, given that uh, they would survey the land. After surveying the land, shouldn't they be... Uh, prepared now to enter the land, God gave them uh, many opportunities to exercise faith. And yet, you see here how sad it is that unbelief can uh, so easily, readily spread. And so if our spiritual life is not grounded in the Word of God, if our spiritual life is not uh, founded strong, then when the storm comes, uh, Jesus says you'll be like a house built upon sand, not upon the good foundation on the rock of Jesus Christ, then the house will fall. The Lord wants us to build our faith strong so that we would continue to follow Him and continue to be willing uh, to uh, allow Him to mould us, uh, to teach us, to show us the good way in which the Lord will uh, bring them to fruition. Alice, you see how the people fretted themselves. They lifted up their voice and cried, giving credit to the report of the spies rather than to the word of God. Imagining their condition desperate, they laid the reins on the neck of their passions and could keep no manner of temple. Like foolish, froward children, Matthew Henry says, they fall a crying, yet know not why they cry for. Why were they crying? God was bringing them to the promised land. How is it that our minds can be so easily uh, swayed, can be so easily influenced, that we would uh, be affected so easily? The survey was not done by faith, but by sight. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. 
it would have been time enough to cry out when the enemy had beaten up their quarters, Matthew Henry says, and they had seen the sons of Anak at the gate of their camp. But those that cried when nothing hurt them deserved to have something given them to cry for. What were they crying for? Was the enemy there coming at them at the gate of the camp? No. No such thing. There was peace in the camp. God was there with them to protect them. A pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day. And so what has gone wrong that caused them to weep the whole night? Unbelief is the root cause. Distrust of God is the root cause. Matthew Henry says, it's a sin that is its own punishment. A sin that is, is its own punishment. When we would go on in unbelief and choose not to follow the Lord, to study His Word, choose to go our own way, um, hear Matthew Henry says, sin is its own punishment. Right? We are at a loss ourselves. Those that do not trust God are continually vexing themselves. No peace. No peace. The world's mourners are more than God's, and the sorrow of the world worketh death. How they flee in the face of their governors murmured against Moses and Aaron and in them reproached the Lord. The congregation of elders began the discontent, verse 1, but the contagion soon spread through the whole camp for the children of Israel murmured, Matthew Henry observed. Jealousies and discontents spread like wildfire among the unthinking multitude which are easily taught to despise dominions and to speak evil of dignities. They look back with costless discontent. They wish that they had died in Egypt with the firstborn that were slain there or in the wilderness with those that lately died of the plague for lasting. So you see here, Matthew Henry says, see the prodigal's madness of unbridled passions which make men prodigal even of that which nature accounts most dear life itself. In other words, they would rather uh, choose to forego their own lives, which is what will happen uh, because of the unbelief. Right? They will perish finally in the wilderness. Never were so many months spent so pleasantly as this which they had spent since they came out of Egypt, loaded with honours, compassed with favours, continually entertained with something or other that was surprising. Isn't it so true? They came out of Egypt, they were in the barren wilderness, there was nothing there, but God was able in the barren wilderness to provide for everything that they need. Do they have eyes to see? Why are they not seeing? Have they not tasted of the manna? Why are they not satisfied? Uh, here uh, it is given to us the uh, costless case right, of the fallen nature of unbelief, the carnal mind. And so here, as you look at it, uh, Matthew Henry says, they wish rather to die criminals under God's justice than live conquerors in His favour. Right? You, you want to be victorious? Then live by faith. For faith is the victory. And this is what the Lord uh, has for His people. So, their despair was groundless. Uh, their despair was groundless. Verse 1 spoke of their crying because they felt 
that if they would go into the promised land, the enemies would consume them. And so they were afraid. And they murmured against Moses, against Aaron, and then they asked this question, does God want us to come into this wilderness to die to die here for entering the promised land would mean certain death for us so would it have been better if we have died in in egypt as slaves and so unbelief brings with it a, a kind of irrational thinking a kind of faithless uh, theology uh, that is so vexing, that brings no peace and brings no joy and brings great distress. Um, why is it that men choose to live like that? Why is it that men uh, choose to forego the good that God has for them? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Saved from what? Well, saved from eternal separation from God in hellfire. And saved from what? Well, uh, saved from uh, uh, time of loneliness where we cry uh, when we cry uh, in our own despair refusing help refusing God's help the one who makes us and sustains us how, how irrational can that be and yet this is what is before us can God uh, do us harm Will God do us harm? Well, that's what the devil wants us to, to understand. So he will keep up his interest in their heart by insinuating them to think ill thoughts of God. So Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, the Lord said to his people thoughts of peace and not evil to give you an expected end you know when god saved us it was a great price that was paid for our redemption and with the great price that was paid is he going to just uh you know uh, cause us to trudge along <laughs> in that journey to heaven of course not he has lined for us a land that is filled with milk and honey. They brought back the grapes. They brought back the pomegranates. And they saw the fruit of the land. And yet, they were willing to be drummed up by the devil's voice to distrust God. How they came, Matthew Henry says, at last to this desperate resolve that instead of going forward to Canaan, they would go backward to Egypt. They would go backward to Egypt. Right? The motion is first made by way of query only. Were it better for us to return to Egypt? <laughs> that was uh, what they said. Right? Would God that we would we had died in the land of Egypt or would God we had died in this wilderness wherefore had the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should be a prey were it not better for us to return to Egypt and they said one to another let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt 
You see, uh, one voice lends uh, evil strength to another, and before you know it, uh, the whole camp was on fire. How sad was it? Um, it was the greatest folly in the world to wish themselves in Egypt or to think that if they were there, it would be better with them than it was. If they does not go forward to Canaan, yet better be as they were than go back to Egypt. Is it better to go back to Egypt? Go back to our sins? Continue to live in our miseries? Uh, we have gone through, as it were, the miseries of life, sin, of sin without God, plagued to the uttermost. Then God saved us, and yet we are willing to go back. Let us make a captain to return to Egypt. In their rebellion, they appointed a captain to return to their bondage. For they knew Moses would not be their captain when they retreat. So it was a greatest folly that has taken place now. Psalm 106 verse 7 says, Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt, they remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way wherewith I speak of thee. Thou shalt see in it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and for bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. So here you see the, the thought of retreating, the thought of going back to Egypt uh, crossed their mind and the folly of the discontent and the impatience that was in the heart uh, uh, caused them to say, is it not better to go back to Egypt? Uh, unbelief uh, has uh, come, comes with it a kind of a blindness, uh, a kind of a, uh, a, a shroud over the eyes, over the mind, that one cannot see the truth from the error and would believe a lie, believe a deception. Why would we believe a deception? Our Lord Jesus says in the days prior to His coming, there will be lots of deception. And if we were to walk by sight, then we would be deceived. And that would be fatal. But those who walk with God, right, you find that that walk uh, will not be an easy walk. Uh, there will be persecution that comes with it. Uh, but what did the Lord say? Well, the Lord says that He will surely help. He will surely be with His people. Uh, were the giants uh, in the land of Canaan real? Yes. But uh, look at what happened when they began to conquer the land. Right? The enemies fell. God devised the strategy. And God wants us to move forward. And moving forward may not be the easiest. There are many obstacles before us. But forward we must go because this is the way to build a land, this is the way by which the army of God must advance. And here we see the thought before us, faithlessness 
uncovered, faithlessness uncovered. Right. The next time we shall be looking at the final plea for faith, verse 5 to 19, and finally the faithful and the faithless contrasted, verse 20 to 35. May the Lord help us. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Strengthen us by Thy Holy Spirit to understand Thy Word, that our faith may be strengthened to follow Thee, that we may advance uh, and march on uh, in conquest according to Thy good will. Lord, uh, grant to Thy people faith to follow Thee. This I ask and pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.